Good afternoon, AI fans, and welcome back to beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. We're here on the sunset portion of day two of three of our Dell Tech Week coverage. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined with Dave Vellante. Super pumped about our next guest. Do you need an AI czar? That, you, that's a lot of people ask me. <laughs> Should we appoint an AI czar? Do they specifically say czar every yeah, time? Is absolutely. that is that is yeah, that the know, oh. <laughs> data czar? A, now it's AI czar. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we could we. It seems like Dell does. We might as well invite him. Invite him to the show. Jeff Boudreau, thank you so much for being here, the chief AI officer at Dell. I can imagine you're a popular man this week. Very popular, but thank you this for having year. me. This year, <laughs> actually, the last yeah, yeah. eight months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, you were, you were working on product at ISG, building five, uh, right? <laughs> a lot of the great products you saw in the last couple of days, so it was definitely started a long time ago. So. Yeah, you must be proud. I am, it's, very proud. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, does it feel, I, I, bet it's, I bet it's like a Christmas moment for you in the sense that you get to see how people are reacting to all the things you've created. Absolutely, I mean, in regards to all the work that Arthur unpacked today on stage and what Michael talked about yesterday, just fantastic, seeing it come to life. I mean, we've been working on some of the AI servers for over three years with NVIDIA. Uh, the work we're doing on storage and software to find, it's just been years in the making, so just some really cool stuff. I'm super proud, like a proud parent, if you will, in regards to what's yeah. going on. Yeah. So, really happy for Arthur, the team, just awesome stuff. How long, how long have you had your title, speaking of Chief AI Czar, or yeah. AI Czar? Uh, we announced it back in September, October timeframe of this past year, so Michael and Jeff, uh, sorry, Michael Dell and Jeff Clark, our uh, vice chairman, reached out to me in the summer timeframe saying, hey, this thing's real, it's exciting time, we got to be at, a, at the forefront. We want to drive, uh, make sure it's the number one priority of the company, and they want to drive some symbolism, so they asked me to come out of the ISG role and take this role to really lead the company forward as we cut across. So it's eight, eight months, I'd say, if I'm doing my math. Pretty right. amazing, because <laughs> it's cool when you think about it. Was it was like the first day, I think, of the, we were at the financial analyst meeting, yes. securities analyst meeting in New York City, and then you hosted a panel um, at the Dell Tech Summit, was that November? Yeah, in Austin, yep. It's just amazing to me if I can observe. It was very good what you did then, but how much further your thinking has come in just a few short months. And what's that from? I mean, obviously customer meetings, internal experimentation. It's a little bit of all that. I would say first and foremost, you know, it's going back to what Michael and Jeff did. They actually said it's a top-down approach from Michael and the board and Jeff down. It, they were very clear at the analyst meeting, the financial summit, that it was our number one priority. We drove that across the company, having focused and dedicated leadership, waking up every morning, going to bed every night, thinking about AI, uh, building a team. So I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but in that eight months, I built a team around, we call it the uh, uh, Center of uh, Innovation and Excellence for AI at Dell. And it's really what I look at as more of an enablement function, but it's for us to, you know, it's really get our AI muscles in place and our knowledge in place. So we have great talent, we want to make sure we bring that talent uh, along. So it was about creating governance, it was great policies, it's enablement. We just launched a huge training across the entire company, fundamentals for all 125,000 Dell employees to be AI, what I call it is an AI curious, like get a learning plan, AI uh, literate, understand the fundamentals, and then AI proficient so we can upskill and go deep in certain areas. But Dave, to your question, it was really you know, a lot of learning. And so what Jeff and Michael asked me to do is really look at the strategy and say, we had a definition of it, but let's refine it now that it's been eight months. And we've learned a lot, as you know. The pace of innovation is, I've never seen anything like it in my yeah. 30 years. Uh, and so learning from the pace of the market, learning from our customers, we fine-tuned it. So we evolved it to accelerate the, develop, um, the, uh, accelerate the adoption of AI. Uh, and then we had our strategic framework that we really unpacked on how we're going to go prosecute against that. And that's all by the learnings from our customers. That's powerful. How big is the team you've built in those eight months? Uh, right now, it's uh, approximately about 100 uh, resources. Uh, it's interesting, we're posting jobs all the time in regards to this stuff, and internally at Dell, since we have great engineering resources, I've had over 4,000 people put their name in for jobs in the company. <laughs> it's uh, wow. been fantastic. Just the, the team is ready. The team, this is a cool time, exciting time. The team is so ready to just be part of it. They see this wave, they're embracing the wave, they want to be part of that curve. They want to have long careers with this thing, so it's just a great time. So you must get this question a lot from customers. Should we put have a, a chief AI officer? I How do. do you organize that? So you got 100 people, are they direct, uh, not direct reports, but are they reporting into you? Is it a matrix organization? How do you? How do you approach that? What do you sure. see? I will tell you, in most of the companies I'm talking to, they're jealous of my role, and I think the big thing comes down to that Michael and Jeff made it real, right? So I think starting from the top down was really important. Uh, my organization, those resources are, are direct to me within it, so I think of a, I have some advanced development work to look at what's happening today, tomorrow, and the next day. I have a core development team that's happening like, helping like John Felch and the Dell Digital team build an opinionated stack internally. 
uh, and then I have some business development and partner ecosystem people on my team. I'm trying to keep that team relatively small, so I think of it, it's like um, the core. And I, I want to make sure we teach, enable the other 125,000 people at Dell. I do not want a centralized thing that only does AI and everybody else works around it. It's got to be part of the way we work and part of our workflow. So Dave, I'm trying to keep it that way. So that's the advice I give to customers and partners. So for them, um, I tell them it's not so much about the title. For me, I guess actually when I took the job, funny fun fact is Forbes I think did an article, but there was only 28, I think I was 28 of 30 at the time. Oh, wow. Now I think we're up to 140 something, so it's growing every day. It, but it's not about the title for me, it's about that dedicated focused leadership, someone getting up every morning, you know, going to bed every night, thinking about AI, how I'm going to drive it across the company and the full enterprise, uh, it, which has been critical for us. Yeah, and keep forward. that staff lean. Yes, is, the, is the key message. Keeping them agile but not siloed. I think that's right. a really good point, especially when we're talking about getting the whole company on board and upskilling everyone. Very curious, I, I, I love how Dell drinks its own Kool-Aid and, and definitely rolls things out internally. How did you prioritize and structure that curriculum that you're sending out to 125,000 employees around the world to learn about AI? It's a great question and it's not super easy. But, I uh, can imagine. <laughs> when, I, when I took the, uh, the, the job or the role uh, eight months ago, one of the things that Michael and Jeff asked me too was really kind of prioritize what was going on within the company and really take a, instead of a BU by BU view, really take uh, an enterprise Dell view. Where, like what's the best benefit for Dell as a company and an enterprise, but also for our customers. So that's what we leaned into. So when I took the team over, there was about 800, I think I shared with Dave in the past, Michael and Jeff had challenged us to ideate, experiment, and POC through the company. And as good Dell employees, we do what we're told. Uh, and we uh, had over 800 use cases going through the company. <laughs> wow. But with that said, I can't tell you that a lot of them have, were tied to a business outcome, or we're going to have a material impact. So part of my role was assessing those 800, really focused in on where we think we could have a critical impact on the company. And so we really went from a, a, a 800 use cases down to four domain areas, 36 use cases, and three AI, three AI disciplines. And to do that, that's where actually, we, that drove how we're going to train the teams to really get up to speed in these different areas. And within a company of our size, there's different personas, different archetypes. You could be a software developer, you could be a finance person, mm -hmm. you could be in the supply chain. We want to make sure everybody comes on the journey, so we want to make sure we had going back to the levels of almost like a university, a 101, a 201, a 301, that everybody could come on their pace for their specific role, and that's kind of how we leaned in. And as you've gone through that rationalization and you've now have these learnings, yeah. I mean, it's only been like, whatever, better part of a year. Yeah. When, you look at, when you look at working with Jen Felch, um, and you think about that application portfolio, yeah. is it, are there areas that are so obvious that you say, wow, we, we were doing this, it was a heavy lift, AI is going to change that, we're going to stop doing what we're doing here, and we're going to modernize it with AI. And the, the common answer that I've heard to that question is, yes, everything. But there's got to be a, a, a spectrum. So what kind of patterns do you see emerging in that uh, regard? A lot of patterns, but the answer to the question, everybody I talk to a lot, I'll say yes to everything. Unfortunately, it goes back to what our use cases were, 800 to, to 36, yeah. it's about focus. So last year, ID8, experiment, POC, this year is focus, execution, and scale. And that's what you have to do if you really want to be successful and kind of chip away. Me being an engineering guy, I, we, we have agile development teams that got a backlog, you iterate through the backlog, this is no different, right? right. Get those use cases mm -hmm. aligned. But the patterns that have been evolving, um, it's, it's interesting. First is about data, probably the most important thing. I keep joking about this, if AI is the rocket ship and let's just say the compute that we talked about today is the engine, data is truly the fuel that lights that. So you need to have good quality data on that and so that's yep. critical to our success. You and I have joked in the past, no data equals no AI or bad data equals bad AI. It is so true. The secondary thing for us, the other big pattern that I'm seeing uh, is data gravity. And what I mean by that, it's going to be a hybrid AI world. Mm -hmm. Just like multi-cloud or hybrid cloud, it is going to be a hybrid world. Edge core cloud, as you guys know, most of the data is growing outside the data center anyway. That's file and object. So it's going to be everywhere. Let's get over with it, bring AI to the data, let's move on so we can support our customers where they are. Yeah. The other big piece um, that I see is no one size fits all, going back to the edge core and cloud. I mean, you guys have seen with the evolution, just in the short period of time around the models, we've gone from large models, it's all about building a large model. It's not there anymore. It's large models, it's small models. It's going from techniques from, from building to things like RAG and inferencing. So I think edge deployments, that's going to change. Um, and then the other big thing that I see uh, is going around the open ecosystem. It is such, right now, such a, a huge opportunity 
and it's such a complex area, no one company can do it alone, and you need an open mm -hmm. ecosystem. So if you think of a modern stack from the infrastructure, so silicon all the way through, uh, to the platform and tool chains, you heard Meta today, all the way into the application layers, and all the services you'd wrap around it, it does take a village to pull off this stuff. So having a great open ecosystem is critical to any when, success. When you think about scaling, yeah. there's, okay, how do we scale this? But there's also, how do we not screw it up? So, <laughs> how do you think about scaling AI, and, and what are the things that you're concerned about, that you're extra careful about not messing up? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. So there's, I guess, all data is not created equal, and there's some data that's more valuable than others. So in spirit of that, if in part of your, you know, getting your data house in order and your data strategy, I think that's a key element, understanding which data is more important to you. And then you can make some tough decisions depending on the type of business you're in or what you're trying to accomplish in that outcome. Uh, so that's kind of the way I focus on I'm, I'm business outcome driven. What we're trying to do, are we trying to grow the business and make money? Are we trying to optimize the business and drive productivity and save money? Are we trying to improve an experience? And that's what I kind of lean into as my KPI or, or goal. Now from regards to uh, approaches in regards to that, I started with areas that I knew we could be successful because I wanted to prove it out, I wanted to build muscles, and I wanted to be in safe zones. So for example, in our call centers, you and I have talked about before, we created a tool called Power Assist. As part of that is, we took our curated knowledge base that has, is, uh, it has high quality data, which is um, closed loop RCA from our engineers. We fed a smaller model with high high quality data, provided a prompt to our call centers. We basically flattened the entire structure, you know, for, from a customer perspective, to do that. But we knew that was a safe environment, be just because of, we understood the, the workflow, we understood the process mapping, we had great data. It was just prime for you that. You bet on sure things. Yeah. Okay, now. And got traction early, which I think is also nice. You get more buy-in across the organization if things start to work. And I, we talked about like hitting singles. A lot of enterprises are experimenting, hitting singles. Do you think we're going to start to see this year, second half of this year, some of those bigger bites? Or is that more 2025 and beyond, where enterprises are going hard after the you know, bigger, challenging um, initiatives. I think my, Jeff Boudreaux's view, uh, yeah. one man's opinion, uh, yeah. what I'd tell you is I'm going to, I think it's going to be slower than people thought in regards to, yeah. we're accelerating the adoption of AI, but we're really leaning into what are the one, three, or five use cases, kind of the example I gave, uh, to actually show proof, uh, show return, before they start really going bigger. And the reason for that is uh, it's a handful of reasons. I mean, some people just don't have their data house in order. All the stuff we've been talking about for data management for the last 10 years, right. I wish we did more, because we'd all be more ready to go. There's obviously concerns around supply and can I get the GPUs or the infrastructure that I need to go do that? And there's also a concern around the talent. Do I have the talent to actually pull off a major AI agenda? So there's a handful of barriers or, or challenges that we have to work through as a team. It is accelerating, people are leaning more into the focus and scale to get some proof points. I still think it's a long tail. I mean. Let's be, let's be honest, I mean, virtualization 25 years into its tail, cloud's 15 years into its tail, AI is just starting. Yeah, and I, and I agree with that. And even though AI, we all talk about how fast things are occurring, I would compress it, these big, chewy initiatives are hard. And they may take years to materialize in terms of throwing off enough cash. So that's where it gets interesting. It's like big bets, you know? And some are going to pay off, and some aren't. And I, and I think we have to embrace that and, and as a, as yeah. we innovate and experiment through this, I mean, the conversation I have with customers, which are fantastic, I'm really enjoying them, but it really starts off in a meeting like, hey, let's talk about growth, right? And they, I don't want to talk about productivity, I want to talk about growth, and they get super excited about that. And then we talk, and as me being a geek, we, we geek out on it, and as, and as part of that conversation, they, at that point, they're like, you know, the tail might be too long, I have to show my board, I have to show my CXO some type of return. Immediately it shifts back to productivity. And it says, okay, what are those use cases like content or coding assistance in a development lab or so on and so forth that I could actually show those singles. a return? That's those playing small singles. ball. That's right. Even though there's a big opportunity for, and it, something's going to happen. Something's going to come out of the woodworks and we're going to go, wow, didn't think of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think, I, I don't think we know how to ask the questions or, or think about problems the same way now that we have these tools. I think we're going to be solving problems we didn't know we could solve, and to your point, have applications that really do blow things out of the water. You know, we'll have, we'll have a PC that's affordable and democratizes access to the internet, like Dell originally created. We'll have an edge device that fits in our pocket, but also is doing way more, and it's, it's we haven't seen it yet. Okay, so I'm curious, as we're talking about this and, and you're talking about a longer tail, you get to look at a lot 
that's happening within the customers. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a lot that you can't tell us about that you get to see. <laughs> However, of the things on that list that you are able to talk about or general trends or whatnot, what, what is it that gets you up in the morning that's really got you most excited, not just as an AI leader, but as a human? Uh, it's, it's a great question and it's very important to me. So Dell's um, purpose, which Michael started many, many years ago, is like, how do we create technology to drive human progress, which is something I'm super passionate about, we've talked about in the past. Um, I think the things that I get excited about, I've done a lot of work recently uh, in two specific areas, but one's in healthcare and one's in academia. And I just think there's, we can change the world fundamentally to make the world a better place. No matter what your social economic background is, there's so much opportunity to provide better healthcare, better education. I will tell you, um, we've worked with Northwestern Medical who are here, uh, um, and we just actually did an announcement a few weeks ago with them, but how do we help improve patient care through the ER and all the way through the hospital. University of Limerick, we work with them on cancer research, which is just some phenomenal stuff there. Um, just so much great stuff that really is really near and dear to my heart, which is really making the world a better place. Healthcare is fascinating. I don't know if you guys follow Ray Kurzweil. We know who Ray Kurzweil is, but when you listen to him, he, it was just a podcast the other day with him on there. He said that, you know, every year we get older. You, you're, you're 50 and then you're 51. <laughs> Maybe you do, older. I don't know. And he, and he, and he said, <laughs> in fact of life, it, it blew me away. He said, actually, no. Today, in 2024, a year, you're only eight months older. And he said, by the end of the decade, you'll be even. Wow. Because so of good. AI. Now, <laughs> a, lot of people a lot of people think as Go a futurist. Go on. <laughs> a lot of people think as a futurist he's kind of crazy, but he's made some really good calls. And he, in the 80s, he said that we'll have AGI by, by yeah. 2029. Yeah. And he's sticking to that. The reason I bring that up is because in healthcare, we're now talking about you know, infinite intelligence solving some really hairy problems yeah. and extending life, you know, longevity. Sure. And it kind of blows your mind to think about it. There, and there is, I mean, I'll leave AGI, AGI alone for a moment, I sure. guess, but in general, I think, um, because I still, uh, so I'm, I'm with them in regards to, if I, leading academics that I talk to, because I have an opportunity to speak with a lot of the academics, uh, they're all aligned on there is, you know, AGI will happen, it's a debate as a when. You and know? John Rose, the same yeah. way, by the Which way. Which is, yeah. you know, yeah. I, and I said it to John, John and I were talking about this the other day, but it's like, you know, some academics are saying it's five years out, and others are saying, no, it's 25 years away. So at the end of the day, that's a, a, a big window of opportunity. <laughs> but, but for me, there's a lot A generation. Of, yeah, just, wow. Casual generation. But, but at the end of the day, you know, I might be retired by then, yeah. who knows? Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> so it will be good. But, uh, it, but one of the things, going back to where you were though, I do think that you know, emergence of technology, so where we are with AI now and, and how, what's going on with quantum computing, when those two kind of connect in the next three to five years, I think there's going to be, you know, talk about drug discovery, think about other things in that medical field, I think there could be some amazing things happening in the short run. And it doesn't have to be specifically a Gen AI thing. There's traditional AI, there's you know, quantum computing, there's a bunch of things I think that could come together to really change scientific discovery for the good. I think that's important, coming together of quantum and AI. They're not like two different things. Oh, no, no, right? they're, yeah, they're very, and, and, uh, the Ben is huge there. AI helps quantum, correct, you know, get there. And maybe, maybe the other way around, you know, quantum fuels AI. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so, and I, I do think you're right. I think it's a very bright, future for us on that front, I, and I love as, as we go from computation to cognition, Michael says it all the time, a lot of the execs do, that's when it's going to be thinking about, oh, well I noticed this pattern in this you know, genome or whatever, and why don't I just go investigate that myself without us even having to prompt something like that to then figure out how we cure cancer. I think, yeah, I think on that front we're all going to be living longer, more gratifying lives as long as we don't blow the next <laughs> five years. <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> Something to shoot for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's very bright, <laughs> as long as there isn't this tiny little, tiny little moment. On that note, not to make it dark at all, but I mean, well, talking about AGI, I can always get a little twisted too. But what do you, what do you think is the biggest risk for the industry right now? There's all this momentum, it's a flood, it's Niagara Falls of innovation. Uh, I'd say the biggest risk that I've seen is it goes back to responsible ethical AI type practices. You know, there's always good actors and bad actors in everything we do, and I think AI right now, and specifically Gen AI, is a little bit of a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are using it right now uh, to, you know, not not for some good things in regards to, you know, we, one of our customers is in the insurance industry. Someone's using, people are using bad actors are using Gen AI to actually put false claims in, like they take a picture of a car, show it dented, and they try to cash out on it. Wow. The good news on the other side of it, Gen AI can actually detect those pretty well. So they actually, you can <laughs> use the technology for good and the bad. 
But I think that's one of the biggest things, like really making sure companies uh, have a good governance model to understand that they have ethical and responsible type um, uh, practices in their companies. It's innovation companies like us and our peers making sure that we have a loud voice and it's also working with the government. So we find balance between, so between the, the corporate corporations or companies doing the right thing through their governance models, innovation companies like ourselves doing the right things, and the government all working together, I think some good things could happen, but uh, that's probably my biggest fear. And the election is going to be eye-opening. Well, right. thank you for taking us down We're that path, is my Well, no, I mean, you didn't want to go to a dark place. <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, geez, man. Yeah, but you know, we, but maybe we'll learn and advance as a society, right? <laughs> Fake news, right? We always, but now we like question everything. You're giving the people a lot of credit right now, man. It is, yeah, no, I know, uh, I think. No, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Oh, I, oh I am, God. you're right, yeah. you're right. You know. they, they don't have their AI PCs Damn. yet. They just, they just announced them yet. It's going to take the devices to detect that the, facade. The good news, the device can help detect some of that. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Fraud detection, anomalies, a whole bunch of stuff. Water marking, yeah, yeah, the whole deal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I went there. Now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've lost My control. rights are at stake, Dave. <laughs> All of our rights are at stake. Kind of funny question for you, since now, now we're here. Now we've arrived at this place in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> this, I haven't actually thought about asking this question. I hope this isn't too controversial. Do you think the government can move at the velocity necessary to keep up with the innovation we're seeing today? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, it's a loaded question. So thank you. <laughs> I just passed the baton I'm back. I'm happy to answer that. <laughs> yeah, my friend Dave will answer that. I'll put, no. So it, it, it's going to be a challenge, right? It, we're, the pace of innovation, the way we're moving now, it, it, for them to do some of their policy, it's, you know, we're already moved on. So some of the policies they've written for eight months ago, we, we're we're going past that. So the good news is, uh, and, and I have meetings actually back in Boston next week, but I've been engaged with some of the different governments. Uh, so uh, the French uh, government had a panel that I participated in in regards to how they did their own compliance, and I think they had a brilliant way of doing it where they've leveraged leaders in the industry like Dassault Engineering and Hugging Face and Mistral, their CEOs like Arthur and, and those folks. Uh, but they were actually part of the panel and helped drive it. They brought in Meta, they brought in Dell, they brought in a whole bunch of people to get our points of view. And they actually made a, a, you know, a really white, nice paper just recently in regards to kind of their thoughts and views. They're trying to influence the EU. So there's just a lot of things, to, a lot of touch points, connective tissue that we have to work yeah. through here. So. I, I have a thought on this. I, I wonder if you saw this in your, your meeting overseas. I think there are a lot of smart people in yes. governments. We know this. Um, some of the smartest people Are you in saying the world. that because they're listening? Um, and I, <laughs> no, but I'm, I, it's easy to be uh, like circumspect and negative about the pace of, of that government can keep up. Because it's easy to say, no, they'll never keep up. And, yeah. and I think that's true. But if they're smart about it, they won't try to adjudicate how the AI is built. Right. They, that's never going to figure that out. It, it, that's, that's too complicated. But there's laws on the books, That's right. if they enforce those laws and they think about the outcomes that, that they want and adjudicate those f toward those outcomes, that I think is where public policy makes sense. Uh, versus saying, all right, you know, show me how you, you know, where are the biases in here, what are the weights, and let, let the industry figure that out. Yeah. Did, you, did you sense that in that EU meeting? Or was it more, we want to get inside the guts and micromanage the No, the, the government didn't want, actually I give them credit, they didn't want to get into the guts. They were actually letting their experts, and so Dassault, you know, Mistral, you know, Hugging Face, all French companies, they wanted them to be there. They wanted them to bring peers like us in to help kind of inform them. It really, I thought it was very thoughtful in how they were looking across the industry, yeah. really getting perspectives, say from the, the tech companies and the innovation and how that could happen, what they needed from a policy perspective, and really find balance. I thought it was really, really good approach. Um, and I actually think the recent policies and something that uh, you know in the Biden administration has is put forward around having chief AI officers and really going in, I think is really helpful. Now the question is, what are they going to do every day? That's you know, <laughs> we'll find out. I think I think it's interesting. My hot take is I do think Europe's moving a bit quicker. The EU is moving faster in terms of putting up some guidelines originally. The bumpers in the bowling lane, I think we may see emerge there quicker than we see universal policy. But who knows? Could what be a lot. I'm who optimistic. Knows? We can tell, and you better be optimistic because you're running <laughs> AI at one of the largest publicly traded companies on the face you're of the earth. You're not optimistic, we're in So yeah, yeah, exactly, you, you have to be our uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Jeff, on that note, thank you so much for making the time for us today. Fun. It's been absolutely wonderful. Dave, you really took us to a dark spot, but uh, we got back to the light, so that's I all do. that matters. Yeah. And we'd love to hear what all of you think at home in the comments on this delightful discussion <laughs> that we've had here at Dell Tech Week. It's day two of three. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.